<laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Nana and Quetti and Ya Jesse here to discuss Nana's Dave and Short Story Collection, Walking on Cowrie Shells. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button right below the viewer screen. It's to the left of the chat area. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button. It'll bump it up in the queue and we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please feel free to engage with each other in the conversation in the chat area. Um, it's nice to know that people are watching, so feel free to chime in when you wish. And we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future. And you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter. You can also follow us on social media. Follow and you can follow our Crowdcast page right here, as well as our YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which past events are put up on later. Our next event is next Monday with Howard Parr in conversation with Denise Hamilton discussing Top Rankin, a punk ska noir novel. Also, please support Book Soup and our authors tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. This will redirect you to our website where you can complete the checkout process. We have signed book plates. And if you buy a copy tonight, you will be entered to win a giveaway for a gorgeous tote from Grey Wolf Press of um, not the cover, but it is related to the book and it's a gorgeous tote. And I put the link to an Instagram post so you can see what it looks like. Um, so that's pretty exciting. You get a, possibly a tote and a signed book plate. So we don't always get double offerings with our books. So that's really exciting. So thank you for that. And um, we're also open for in-store browsing. So if you're local to Los Angeles, please come say hi daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Nana Nkwedi is a Kane Prize finalist and alumna of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her work has garnered fellowships from McDowell, Kimbilio, UCross, and the Wurlitzer Foundation, among others. She is a professor of English at the University of Alabama. Our In Conversation guest tonight, Ya Jesse, was born in Ghana and raised in Huntsville, Alabama. Her debut novel, Homegoing, won her the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award for the best for first, best first book, sorry, I don't know why I put the the in there, the Penn Hemingway Award, and for a first book of fiction, the National Book Foundation's 535 Honors for 2016, and the American Book Award. She is also the author of the best-selling novel, Transcendent Kingdom, which was out last year, and she lives in Brooklyn. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. I'm really excited to hear from both of you, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Na Nana and Ya. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Hi. Hi, lady. Thank you it's so much so Dan, for that wonderful. Yes, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Book Soup. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. I think before we get into the questions, Nana is going to read a little bit for us. So we're in for a treat. Uh, over to you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Book Soup, for having me. Thank you, Sam, for hosting this. Um, thank you so much for all of you readers coming out here this evening. And um, I'm so excited to kind of continue bringing uh, this this kind of like, I guess it's like the prom for my book, like having this prom for the book coming out in the world. I'll be reading an excerpt from Kinks. It's the final and the longest story in my collection, Walking on Cowrie Shells. And it's the story from whence the book gets its name. I chose that piece because I'm a bit of a sap and a bit of sucker of a sucker for nostalgia. That piece was like the first piece that I ever read. At the time, I read it in this anthology series in Iowa City that Ya Jesse was hosting. And I was so nervous because I hadn't read any of my work out in the world. And um, I call this piece like an interesting story of love and hair grease. And it, it's broken down into sections that are um, correspond with a woman's, a black woman's hairstyle. And that particular black woman in the story is Jennifer Chandep. And she's a first generation Cameroon American. She's in love with this firebrand of a man named Dr. Kwame Johnson. And he is a bit of an interesting character. So for them, the, the course of true love is not running smooth. It actually is full of lots of complications and lots of kinks. All right, so as I said, I'm from kinks and this is the, the section pressed. 
When Jennifer was a child, her mother had pressed her kinks with a hot comb each Saturday night. By Sunday morning, her hair was as starched as the pleats of a church dress. When she was bright-eyed in Sunday school, Jennifer saw her obedience as Christ-like, saw the lick of holy fire in the blue flames of the oven range, grew to welcome, hands meekly folded in her lap, the molten hot comb as God's shining instrument. It was about enduring, a test and a testimony. She never squirmed, though her mind filled with premonitions of hellfire during the brimstone sizzling of her strands. Still there were signs and wonders to be had in the steadiness of her mother's hand. She was never burned, bore no errant mark of Cain. Her mother was faithful to this evening ritual, these kitchen vespers. God forbid the rapture come and her child was found nappy and wanting. As a young woman, Jennifer let her hair and herself grow unruly. She roamed free and unfettered, her nights were wild and her own. This was how she felt now on the Saturdays that Kwame came to her, demanding many things, both monstrous and delightful. She learned to relish Sunday morning bruises as the signs and wonders of their sweet tussle, knowing she too had marked him with tooth and nail and the slick of her tongue. Only with him did she discover her appetites, how she liked the rough mouthful that was the word fuck on her tongue, almost as much as the thing itself. Like to trace her toe along the seam of him, just to watch him grow shivery, becoming a herky-jerky creature, a thing unspooled. After Kwame had long gone back to parts unknown, she would lie there short of breath, yet finally fully alive, her face pressed to the sheets to catch remnants of his smell, a smoky, spicy thing that brought to mind foreign altars where the righteous sacrifice loved ones to their insatiable gods. All right, I'm gonna read one more section, blow out. Kwame kept her in bed for days at a time, sweating out her blowout, edges and toes curling again and again, in moments between, she would lie along the stalk of him, tracing twin scars along the hollows of his side. Battle wounds, he'd answered to questions unspoken. Ear to chest, hairs tickling her cheek, his voice a grumbling lullaby telling tales of ancestors, of kings, of queens from Africa past. He claimed them by birthright. No genealogy sites traced his DNA across the diaspora. Yet by his estimate, he was descended from Sheba and Sundiata, from Makeda and Menelik. He joked about his credentials, a Morehouse, Princeton, and Harvard alum, bread and butter on the stoops of bed where your street cred, the only pedigree that truly mattered, was measured by number of shots survived, by who and how many feared you. He was cocky completely at ease in his skin and his identity. It was seductive as fuck. Head on his chest, Jennifer sometimes bit down on his nipple till she drew blood. Him suckling in the knowing ease for herself. She, the child of a timid mother, ever grateful for kitchen scraps. One of only two black girls in her Scarsdale Elementary School her mother had stayed mute on the subject of their culture. What did she know of her heritage, her brilliant ancestry? No matter how many boardroom doors Jennifer walked through, sometimes she felt her steps falter. In the Ghanaian beauty shop, at the Awing tribal meetings, she felt like a counterfeit African, felt the unworthiness of the maid's child tiptoeing through the servant's entrance, lightly, quietly, like she was walking on cowrie shells. All right, thank you. Oh, well, that was so beautiful, Nana. Thank you so much for reading. Um, I also, I love that you read the blowout section because I have a blowout currently. <laughs> so I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember, um, I remember reading this at, you know, I remember reading this at, um, 
anthology and I was so nervous and you were like, gotta go on stage, Nana, you gotta go. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I didn't remember that that was uh, your first reading. So I love this full circle moment where we're getting to be together again and hearing you read from that very piece. Um, but again, everyone, welcome to this event. We are celebrating the wonderful Nana Nkwezi and her collection of short stories, Walking on Cowrie Shells. I've got my coffee in the back here. Um, uh, really, really delighted to see this, this book out in the world. Um, so I wanna start, for those of you who don't know, just by saying that Nana and I know each other. Um, we both attended the University of Iowa's Writers Workshop at the same time. Um, and Nana was actually the second person that I met on campus. And I remember feeling once I saw her, um, okay, like I can be at ease here. Like I've, I've found a person um, with whom I can like ride this ride with. And so um, it's, it's absolutely delightful for me to see her book out in the world um, and to know that, that we've made it on the other side of this publishing process. So congratulations, Nana. Um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about your path to this first book. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those people that kind of went straight from college to grad school, um, had this very kind of direct line, but I know that you didn't have that direct line. Can you talk a little bit about what you did before you came to writing and, um, and how you found ways to come back to writing? Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting because I've been writing since I was nine years old. I was this little nerdy, you know, blue stocking kid who was like constantly had a book. And like, I always say like Lizzie Bennett was my bestie back in the day. And I was like writing Star Wars fan fiction, but I never really privileged writing like that because I'm the daughter of immigrants and, you know, it, it didn't seem like a viable career option. So I did the good immigrant daughter thing and I went to undergraduate thinking I was going to go to do international law. Then I went to law school. So I kept on doing this, but the entire time there was this drum beat. I was writing the entire time and I kept, and, you know, taking all these classes or these workshops here and there. And I kept on saying, well, it's okay. One day, you know, like I'm not going to write, you know, one day with my family, you know, I'll write like, like one story, what have you. So I didn't really privilege like writing full time or kind of consider it as a possibility until like I was sure that all my siblings were in college and had graduated and had jobs and my family was okay. Then I was like, oh, you mean I can write now? Can I do this? <laughs> can I do this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So like I was already like a working professional. I had already in the world, you know, living my life. And then I was just like, no, no, come on, get over yourself be about it, right? You you want to do this. This is your calling. You've been doing this since you were a kid, right? You know? Mm, mm. And was there something in particular that like made you feel as though you now had the permission? You said seeing all of your siblings off into the world, um, knowing that they were secure, but um, why Iowa? Like what brought you to, um, to graduate school? Well, I'm still an African immigrant's daughter. So it was just like, you know, you mean you're going to leave your job and just start writing, you know? Yeah. Mm -mm. I had to get a degree, I had to be pedigree, you know, give legitimacy to the whole thing, enterprise, right? So like when I could tell my parents that, oh, no, 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 I'm going to get a degree. Ah, degrees, we understand degrees, <laughs> you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely know the feeling. Um, I, I love that your first book is a short story collection. I, we were, I was just talking to Sam before the event started about how um, we're often told, we're often kind of discouraged from writing short story collections. The idea that um, they're somehow less privileged in, in the American literary landscape. This is a beautiful short story collection. There are so many wonderful short story collections. I'd love to hear you talk about why short stories um, what drew you to the form? What do you appreciate about the form? What is it um, that the form affords you that a novel cannot, for example? Um, yeah. Yeah, you and I have had this East Coast, you know, East Coast, West Coast, Coast rivalry 
me talking <laughs> about novels versus short stories. And like you are like a bona fide, like, you know, died in the wool, that's your impetus to write a novel. And I think for me, my main like impetus is like, oh, short stories. I've always loved short stories. I've written a novel because, you know, like as you said, like short stories sometimes are like the red step headed step children of like, you know, of the publishing world. So everybody kept telling me, Oh, if you want to sell your short story collection, you've got to finish a novel and bundle it together, right. you know. It wasn't something that was coming to me intuitively, like, you know, intuitively, like I am a person who likes to kind of like wander and roam. So the short stories allowed me to kind of go into a space and enjoy that space for a set time and then leave, like, you know, when I'm ready to leave, rather than kind of like, I don't want to meander, I don't want to overstay too long at the party, you know? And um, so it's always been like, I think I'm naturally a short story writer. Um, I, but I love all forms of storytelling. So I'll try my hands at graphic novels. I'm hoping to try my hands at writing screenplays and, and, you know, and what have you, but, uh, I love, you know, like Alice Munro or Lee K. Abbott or even Karen Russell's first short story collections. I feel like you can get a whole world in those spaces. And I love the kind of compactness of it, you know. And it's interesting because in workshops, in literary journals, what we see primarily is short stories. But then yeah. when it gets time to get to like the bookshelves, we hear that, oh, but now we need a novel. So. Mm -hmm what's a girl to do, but do what makes sense for her and allows her to kind of be her most creative. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, you're right that the um, the workshop model is based on short stories. And so, so many of the novelists that we love when they were going through school, if they chose to get an MFA, were writing short stories. Um, so I think so many of us uh, have an appreciation for short stories and we don't often see that reflected back in, in the consumption um, of literature. Unfortunately, I'm a huge fan of short stories, though I was never a master of the short story form um, in, the, in the way that you have so clearly mastered it. Um, to keep on the subject of the short stories, I, I'm always really interested in how uh, a writer structures a short story collection. Um, which of the stories in this book came first for you? Which one did you write first? Which one did you write last? Um, how did you decide on the order, on the flow? Are you one of those writers who would be kind of offended if you found out that people were skipping around um, because you wanted this kind of effect overall? Uh, what, what, what did the structure look like for you? People do that. People get mad, like if you jump to section to like story three. That's interesting. I yes, had no idea I that actually, was a thing. Um, I wish I could remember the the name of the book, but somebody had an in the introduction. It had a note about how the stories were meant to be read in this order. And he had spent all this time making it in this order. Um, don't skip around. So uh, I so I know it's a thing. some people maybe like especially some of those story collections which are like basically novels in in short stories or like you yeah. know and people are they want things to accrue meaning in a certain way but for me i feel like you know my though my stories like inhabit the same universe they each have something different to offer the reader. So one second you could be at a Comic-Con, the next second you're dealing with Mami Watas, and the next section you're dealing with like, you know, the story that I just read about a relationship that's like tumultuous, right? So I don't, like, I think that overall you can just immerse yourself in the language and just in, enjoy the kind of, you know, specificity of the, the place and the time for each of these, you know, these tales. And I, you know, jump around as you like, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to make a, like, you know, the the titles of the stories as interesting as possible. So if you're like, oh, Green Check at Momocon gets my, you know, I don't know what that <laughs> is, you know, yeah. jump to that, you know. So yeah, so that's how I feel. Um, when I was putting together the collection, I didn't have a, a sense of like what would flow naturally into the other. I think that, you know, you know at the time when I was writing this book, a lot of link short story connections were coming out. And I felt like maybe, oh my God, do I need to strengthen linkages between them or what should I do? But I feel like, you know, 
know, I was lucky and at my publisher, they were focused more so on like letting me, letting my freak flag fly, letting me write what into what gave me joy so that I didn't have to kind of try to artificially marry stories together. There are linkages, like I say, in the language and I write about a lot of uh, women with trying to find their agency. I write a lot about like um, hyphenated Americans who share my background and, and the, the continent and here in the States. So the, that is the sense where everything is kind of linked. But I don't want, you know, expect like readers to read in any particularly helpful and kind of telling me like, okay, this might flow into this better. And like, you know, and the title story, um, it just, um, it takes a village, some say, was the story that kind of like he said, this is like a thesis statement, right? It shows some of your interests. So it kind of gets people ready that, okay, wrap in this is what you, the kind of ride you can expect. So that's why that story came first. Um, in terms of the writing chronology, Kinks is like my oldest story as well. And yeah. um, I wrote that after like a bad breakup way back in the day. Like the first time I wrote mm. it was just like, that man did me wrong. <laughs> you know, so, so. <laughs> but um it, it over time, like, you know, it became, you know, like something larger, not about me, but just about the idea of relationship and what one is willing to give up and, and compromise in terms of themselves to be loved by someone, right? Like, you know, we always talk about being in love as being seen, but sometimes there are people who don't want to see you or they only want to see a certain version of your you that they find palatable. And that's more so what that story is about, like trying to figure out like, where do you, where do you um, find that kind of limit? Where do you decide that this is who I am, I'm strong and who I don't need to, to negate myself to be loved, so. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um... I want to return to something you just said about uh, about like people with hyphenated realities. Um, like I think of you as, as a writer who really, really um, kind of specializes in this liminal space between culture. Like all of these stories um, are are straddling lines uh, of place. People who exist within that hyphen. Um, and I'm thinking about, at least when I was coming up as a Ghanaian American, not really feeling as though I had models for this kind of writing. Like, you know, when you were hearing about African writers here in the States, like it was often a Chebe, maybe someone would mention Edu or uh, Ngugi Watiango, um, but it wasn't um, something that felt like it was speaking to my experience of being both um, African and American, of kind of having that duality. Um, and so it's really exciting to me to see work like yours, work like Dinao Mangus Dews, um, even Adichie, like people who are coming out with these books that are, I think, exper experiencing um, or walking the line between these experiences of, of Africa and America. Um, so I would love to just hear you talk about what it has felt like to you um, to try to kind of blend culture in your work and what it means to you to be able to do that. Um, is this something that you too were seeking in your reading life um, when you were younger and not being able to find it? Is it that Morrison thing of, you know, if you want to see a book in the world and it hasn't been written, you have to write it? Um. I think you're a little frozen. Uh -oh. It could be me, I, I can never tell. No, I can't see Nona either. Okay. Um, or hear her anymore. Yeah, I think she's dropped in. Miss Mar oh. oh, I just got a whisper. Mm hmm. She still says she's on screen. Back. I am logged in. Okay. 
I'm back. Sorry, I'm, I'm logged into two different devices because the internet in my apartment. All right, so um, Ms. Morrison was definitely on my mind, like as I was thinking about writing stories that I wanted to see in the world. Um, I am, grew up reading a lot of like liminal space, um, third culture, like myself, but not from an African background. I would read a lot of um, Desi writing from, you know, like um, people who were South um, Asian American, uh, Jhumpa Harry is a favorite. I was reading um, Caribbean American writers. I was reading um, ABC American born Chinese writers, much like Lance and Mantha Chang, our, you know, workshop director. Yeah. I was reading, um, you know, like all these different, um, you know, Nisei and Issei, you know, first gen writers, but they did not come from our background, like this hyphenated African background. And um, I wanted to privilege that because that was something that, you know, like that I understood that my background, especially when I went to, I did live in Cameroon for some time, but for me, that was like a kind of like, you know, we had been calling it back home, right? But then it was like yeah. me adjusting to that reverse migration, right? So that immigrant story that where like someone comes from, from Africa and comes to America, that wasn't my story, right? And our stories are being American and trying to find that kind of space to honor the traditions and the background of our parents, but also make space for like, you know, what America has to offer in terms of like, you know, your individualism, making different life choices, you know. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to write about, especially for kids, like you're saying, like we grew up and that wasn't out there, right? Um, when I did take African um, um, literature classes, it was, you know, based in Africa, and I took, you know, literature in, in Africa, and the focus, oh Lord. Can you hear me when I break out? Like, um, and the focus was um, on like, like Ferdinand and Yono. Okay. Now you're back, I can hear you. Yeah, I actually have, like I said, I have you open up on another um, device just in case. But uh, yeah, like I was in a section, I was in a situation. Hmm. I can still hear you. Now you're missing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Like uh, Crowdcast is doing us dirty today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sam, can you still hear me? Yes, I can see and hear you clearly. Okay. Um, right now, Nana's frozen for me, unfortunately. Same. I should have prepared my like solo intermission in case this <laughs> happened. <laughs> Do you have a favorite story from the collection that stood out to you? Um, do I have a favorite story from the collection? I mean, I love kinks. I love the story that uh, that Nana wrote mm -hmm. uh, or that Nana read from um, the last story in the collection. That's probably my favorite. I think for anyone who has gone through um, a devastating breakup, that's, that's one that you can kind of just feel um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in your, in your heart, um, so I, I feel a connection to that one. Um, I love the Comic Con so story. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying the prose was so potent and beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I mean, even just hear it, getting to hear her her read from it too, to relive it in that capacity. Yes, um, she read it really beautifully. Nice. Um, some you know when some people read, they just read through. I mean, like even if I'm you know if I'm reading my own, I'm like running through it because it's devastating to do that um or like <laughs> trying to read it but she really gave us the whole experience so that was awesome yeah. 
It's funny to me to hear that she was nervous to read at Anthology because clearly, as we all heard, uh, a brilliant reader. Um, yes, really, yeah. really gorgeous. <laughs> I'm re-inviting her. I, um, it looked like she was still in, but I... She just wrote in the chat, so maybe she's soon to reappear. Thanks for bearing with us, folks. It's always an adventure on virtual virtual events. It really is. And <laughs> I thought we had surpassed the crowdcast issues. Yeah, I'm sympathetic. I was saying to Sam before, for those um, of you who didn't get to hear, um, that the crowdcast for me in the past has been one that I drop out of on occasion. So I'm surprised it's not me and that it is Nana. Um, but we'll, we'll get her back soon. Um, in the meantime, I don't think anyone has written a question in the ask a question. So if if you have any burning questions, we're, we're heading into um, that time. Uh, so feel free to put a question in and hopefully when Nana reappears, we can start asking some of those as well. Yes. And now is a good time to get your copy of the book at the green button, if you haven't already, with signed book plate. This is not ideal, but if we have to, in the past, we did have someone um, call and just be on through the phone. On the phone? Yeah. Okay. Oh, here, here she is. Hi, Nana. Hey, sorry about that, folks. Like, I, I tried, like, this is like my third device I'm on now. Crowdcast is just oh, like, wow. like, like I said, I've been doing this and haven't had like so many times. My bad. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see and hear you. Welcome. Um, I I just said this while you were gone, and I said this to Sam before. Like, um, it's you know this is the this is the world of the virtual <laughs> events. Thank you all for bearing with us. Um, we've all been there, so no worries. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe let's move on to a question about research. Um, there's a story here that takes place at Comic-Con. Uh, that's one of my favorite stories of yours. Um, there are stories that uh, incorporate real headlines um, uh, from criminal cases. Um, what does research do for you? How do you incorporate it into your work? How do you think of it? Uh, how does it frame your work? Yeah, for me, like um, research comes like after like maybe some of the initial kind of like groundswell of a narrative happens to me. I start from voice and from like a insisted type of narrator or protagonist that has a lot to say to me. And then like, you know, maybe I'll come across a story or have to kind of like, you know, put a pin in it to look to something at something deeper. Like, um, like some of the stories that incorporate the headlines, like I remember at that time, like, you know, I mentioned I, you know, I'm a good immigrant daughter. So at the time I actually was a nurse and I was seeing these stories about all these nurses being killed by their husbands because yeah. of these changing gender roles and the idea of yeah. like, you know, what is masculinity when you're not necessarily the provider in a family. And I wanted right. to explore that. So um, that ended up being like, you know, sending me down a rabbit hole much as my protagonist it does in the story, um, just like reading up more and more articles, you know. So that was like, you know, the, the extent of the research, just kind of learning, like, why haven't I heard of these stories of these Black women, you know, kind of like a say her name. I wanted to know more about who these women were. And I used the main woman as the, like uh, their avatar, right? Um, she ends up being more alive on the page than even, you know, her husband is to me. Um, so that was that the re extent of research in that particular narrative. In other stories I have like, you know, Comic-Con, my research was just me being a big old blurred. I'm a black nerd. <laughs> I am. I've been to Comic-Con. Yeah. 
So, so I was just drawing from stuff that I like and that I'm interested in, like, you know, fan fiction. I write it. So, you know, so <laughs> all that kind of, you know, like, uh, so I was very much ensconced in that world. And I thought it would be a, a cool backdrop, you know, to like, you know, show like that there are black nerds and African nerds out there. And like, you know, what does that look like? What does that space look like? And particularly for that story, I have a young woman who is trying, it's like a consular roman, like a young woman who's coming of age as an artist, right? Mm. And trying to figure out once again, how does that clash with these traditional notions of who she should be as being this good immigrant daughter, like, and she, write stories for a living, you know, and yeah. not, a le not let alone not like Pulitzer Prize winning stories, but stories for graphic novels. You say what, T, you say what, you know, like for parents, <laughs> that's my African parent voice, <laughs> like, huh? <laughs> you writing for cartoon? You know? Yeah. So those were kind of like, you know, um, John's that I would take into to research, but typically it would happen, the research would happen, like maybe at just subliminally, you know, you're reading an article, you're living your life, you're out there in the world, staying engaged and staying informed. And like, I read a story about like, you know, um, about like bombings that were happening in Northern Cameroon from Boko Haram. And that ended up kind of like me wondering, what does that mean? What does that entail for the people who not only died, but people who survived, like, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and that story might become us, becomes us, became, came out of that understanding that like, you know, this young girl, like, you know, some people, women, even if you survive, like, you know, you could become an outcast. You could be seen as like, you know, everybody's looking at you. You already have your survivor's remorse and survivor's guilt. And then everybody's looking at you like, would you have witchcraft or juju? Because how did you yeah. live, right? How did you survive? And yeah. you're sitting there, thinking, how did I live? How did I survive? And trying to figure out the next step on how how can I thrive after such a traumatic event? So that's how those things came about. Mm. You said um, earlier just now that um, that you feel like you can hear the character speaking with you, that you're kind of listening to the voice. I feel like there are uh, camps of writers, those who um, write with that voice in their head where they feel like uh, the story is talking to them, the characters are talking to them, and and other writers who don't feel that way. Can you say a little bit more about what that feeling looks like and how you have um, kind of trained yourself to listen to the voice? Um, what is the what is the process of starting a story? Um, what does that look like for you? Yeah, honestly, like I, I, I speak about it almost like feeling like, you know, I'm being possessed because yeah. the, when the characters, when the voices come, they're pretty insistent. Like, you know, um, like it takes a village, some say was initially one story, like your partner, Matt, read, read one story during a workshop together. We, he read um, Our Girl. And then like a year later, I wasn't planning to write a second part. Then like the protagonist of that story was like, what about me? You, I didn't, mm -hmm. I, what, don't I have things to say? What about my voice? You know, I didn't even yeah. get to have a voice in the first piece. I was called Our Girl. And she was insistent. She kept on bothering me, bothering me. It was really annoying. <laughs> it was really annoying. <laughs> so I just like, okay, 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 okay. I'll write your story, right? I'll write it. I'll write it. And then like all these things, like sometimes you just go through your life, right? And things are happening. And then later on, you'll find out, okay, I learned about this because that would be because that was part of this particular character story. That's how it happens for me. And my narrator, narr narr narrators and heroes and protagonists tend to be pretty voicey, you know, cause it takes a lot, you know, like I'm pretty like, you know, self-sufficient, you know, as writers, we're all in our head anyway. I've got a pretty strong mental voice. So, right, so you've gotta be in pretty interesting and voicey and, and have a tale to tell for me to be like, okay, all right, let me listen to you for a second, right? Just for a second, <laughs> let me just see what you have. Just for a bit. Yeah. So that's kind of what happens with me. Like, you know, like, you know, I will just be thinking about something and then all of a sudden like a voice will come to me and say, and then I'm like, oh, that's the voice of that. Like, you know, or if there's a project or a topic that I was interested in dealing with, but just like in a kind of very la-di-da ephemeral way, um, yeah. 
there'll be a voice that you know that comes to me and says, you know, that was my story, right? And that that's how it happens. <laughs> so mm. that's so interesting. I I have never felt that way. Like I that's never been the case for me. I love hearing writers talk about that because it it again like teaches you that there are so many different paths to uh, to getting a story out. Like usually for me, it's like an image. Um, like I'll see something and then I'll try to figure out how to how to get that thing on paper. Um, mm. But I, I very rarely like hear um, the voices of my characters. Um, so I, I, I love that. Um, if you haven't yet written a question down in the ask a question feature, um, please check it out. I see one in there. I may ask one more uh, before we dip into the questions. So go ahead and put your questions down. Um, but uh, the question I wanted to ask you was about genre. Um, you talked a little bit about being a black nerd. Um, you know, the, we know our program at Iowa was very kind of literary focused. So there were people who were writing in other um, in genre um, outside of literary fiction. Um, one of your beloved teachers who I didn't get a chance to have, Kevin Brockmeyer, um, is, is a master of, of this kind of literary genre uh, realm. Um, Karen Russell, another of your teachers who people adore, who I also didn't get to have, um, is uh, another person who comes to mind as being a master um, of, this, of this form. Um, what does genre give to you? Um, who are some of your favorite writers who are working um, in in various genres? And um, and yeah, how did you know that you wanted to kind of have this arranging uh, collection that that did traverse all of these different boundaries that we sometimes in the writing community like think of as fixed? Um, but as we see in your book, they aren't fixed or they need not be fixed. Yeah, I mean, like, fortunately, like I came about at a time when I think a lot of writers were were doing what you're saying, kind of being like, you know, Kelly Lane, Karen Russell, Kevin Brockmeyer, you know, there was a lot of kind of slipstream stuff happening between like, you know, literary fiction and, and, um, liter and like genre fiction. I mean, I always knew I was going to be in that space because, you know, as I'm, I, I've been saying, like, you know, our African heritage, like sometimes there's this, this idea of, you know, mystical stuff is happening all willy nilly, like, you know, all the time, like people mm. talking about things like you and like with a straight face. So I've always been in that kind of liminal space where, you know, like the supernatural and the natural and real and unreal has like, you know, been part of the discussion in like peer groups and families. So I, it just made sense to me that I could do that. Plus like that nerdy part of me always wanted to do that anyway. And I was really fortunate, like at the time, like I say, when I was there, um, Kevin Brockmeyer came and did a, a speculative fiction class. Karen Russell came and Carmen Maria Machado, you know, was there and EJ yeah. Fisher. And they'd both been to like Clarion West, like the, speculative fiction and like boot camp as I call it. And they encouraged me to apply and to go as well. So I felt really privileged that that I was being seen, like, you know, that all parts of my, the adventurous part of me that wanted to do that type of work was being seen and not poo pooed, you know? Um, and that like, even within the workshop, I never had anybody say to me, well, I really don't want to read about your zombies or anything like that, yeah. you know? I think that, you know, the space for there's a space for that type of writing and like I'm always telling well people like you know well Octavia Butler is a MacArthur genius so what what you got you know so I'm Absolutely. I'm a big lover right I'm a big believer in that kind of like you know do whatever you need to do to tell the story the best way possible so sometimes like when I'm trying to tell like a straight like you know straight realist story something will happen that I, you know, I'll get blocked and then I'll kind of like go into that space of like allegory or like fantasy or speculative and that kind of helps me break open the story. So I just realized sometimes you have to come at a story slant to get where you mm. need to go. So. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And I, I loved what you just said about like, you know, the the cultural heritage allowing for this kind of thinking because there is like 
if you say something is magical, well, like magical to whom? Like for some people, this is this is realism. Like a ghost is real, you know. Um, yeah. So that's that's really that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from Jack Wang. Thank you, Jack. Um, they ask, was Iowa a good experience for Iowa each of you? Is the workshop more welcoming now to POC? Yeah, when we went there, there were three of us, <laughs> three black girls, you, me, Alexia, um, authors, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but then the next year there were like seven or eight black um like you're not, so we, this was like three of us out of a cohort of fifty. Um yeah. and I don't think there were black poets. Yeah. I think black poets we were like the unicorns, like, oh, I've seen a black <laughs> poet, you know. Um, yeah, you know. And then the following year there were more and more of us. So I think that the 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 um workshop, particularly under like, you know, Sam Chang's leadership has just become more and more diverse, more and more welcoming to so many different voices um, and so many different types of narratives. So, you know, I never felt like, you know, stifled and I did my best to mentor, like anytime, like, you know, students of color would come in to join us. I was just like, okay, immediately come to my house. You know, like, you know, you've been, you were there, <laughs> like, yeah. People having brunches and making sure people had a sense of community, right? So um, community is what you make it. Like, you know, the, the farther you go in almost any place, like sometimes there's less and less of us, right? You know, so we just have to do the work to make sure that that's not always the case. Mm, yeah, that's true. I I mean, when I got there, none is right. There were, there were three of us in, in our cohort that first year, um, yeah. three black women. Um, and I remember uh, getting your name, uh, just your first name, since I must have gone to uh, to kind of register with some people. And this is how Nana became the second person that I met. And I saw it and I was like, are there two Ghanaians in this program? Because Nana's also a very common Ghanaian name. Um, so I'd never been one of two in a space, um, two Ghanaians in a space like that. And then lo and behold, just a couple of years later, another Ghanaian came into the program, um, our, our mutual friend, Derek and Nuro, who has a book coming out in 2022. Um, so yeah, it is slowly, I think, uh, opening. And as Nana said, like much credit is due to uh, the director of the program, Sam Chang, um, who I think has, has really, really changed the um, atmosphere of that place from, from the stories that you used to hear about from the time of, of people like Frank Conroy. Um, one of my teachers at Iowa, um, uh, a brilliant writer named Julie Oringer, um, told us that she was one of two women when she, when she went to Iowa. Um, which now feels unfathomable. Um, so again, like this, this rate of progress is quite slow. Um, and yet I feel like we arrived at, um, at a time when things were, um, were at least, at least better. And we had each other, um, which, which has meant a lot, not just uh, during our time there, but obviously now here tonight. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, I think we have a few, a few minutes left. Um, if anyone wants to add more questions to the chat, feel free. If not, I can keep asking Nana questions. Um, um, one other question that I have for you is what are you reading right now? Um, and maybe in addition to that, who are some of your favorite writers working today? Oh my goodness, I mean, I'm only now starting to read for pleasure again because, you know, like, you know, when you're, you know how it is when you're in the middle of editing the book, it just becomes all, it was all encompassing. Yeah. That was my yeah. main focus. I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about anything else, but right now um, I'm reading. All right, there we go. I'm reading um, Kevin Brockmeyer, um, um, oh, like, so who else? Kevin Brockmeyer's new short story collection and, I just ordered um, those oral, oral 
oral story, like or oral history stories. And um, mm -hmm. so I ordered um, Josie in the, the, the six. Uh, so we'll see, like I'm, I'm just now like allowing myself to actually start reading for pleasure again and not all of the, you know, cause I'm, I'm trying to start writing again. And, um, but I was so focused on being like, you know, moving in the middle of a pandemic and starting a new job. And my life was just all about like, you know, outward facing, you know, things. So now I'm starting to enjoy the pleasures of being in somebody else's narrative again, so. Mm. Well, you, um, you kind of answered it, um, but maybe my last question will be to see if I can draw a little more out of you um, about what you're working on now. And please feel free to not answer this question because I always uh, evade it when I am asked. So do what feels right. No, you do. <laughs> <laughs> You're so like Neo in the Matrix with it. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you feel like you're gonna jinx it or something, you know. And do. it does change. It's, it's very my weird. one. Yeah. It's my one superstition. Weirdly, is that if I if I talk about it too early, it'll just disappear. Um, but you know, every writer's different. Maybe you don't feel that way. So if you if you want to give us just a little a little taste. We would take it. Well, I'm going back and revisiting, like now that I'm writing for pleasure again, I'm going back and revisiting a story that I started at Clarion like so many umpteen years ago. It was a sci-fi novella um, based upon this, like, you know, story of these intergalactic uh, race of slaves and their, their slave ship, like, you know, slash spaceship crash lands in the Hudson River and then get you know, quarantined and like integrated into American society, but in the hood, you know? So mm. I get to kind of talk about like, you know, identity and what it means to be, cause they're like, you know, designated black, you know, in America and what that means. And I get to kind of look at multivalent versions of black identity. I get to, you know, write some rap. I got bars in there, I'm writing rap, you know, <laughs> cause like the, it, <laughs> the alien girl at the center, she's a rapper. So it's lots of fun. Once again, it just ended up being like, okay, like her street kind of, like I say, uh, Frank Street Patois was what like got me into the story because she was just like, you know, mm, I got a story for you, <laughs> Nana. <laughs> so Amazing. Amazing. That sounds phenomenal. I can't wait to see it. Um yeah, that's all for uh, from me. Thank you so much, everyone. I think Sam might pop back on, um, but this has been such a joy. Congratulations again, Nana. Uh, and thank you all for coming. <laughs> I know she's still here. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> oh no. Well, hopefully you can hear me, Nana. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. This was such a joy and a great conversation. Um, just going to second everything y'all said. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Um, this is rewatchable, so feel free to share with your friends. Um, encourage them to get um, their copies. And congratulations, Nana, on your book. I can't wait to read it. It's in the mail. So. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. So <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> I can't see you. Okay, good. Well, thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Um, it was wonderful. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye.